Hello everybody and welcome to part two of my new Books for Art Inspiration series. I'm here with my two new little bird friends that you may have seen me painting in another video. We're here to talk to you today about three books that have inspired me or are inspiring me on my creative journey. All of the books I talk about in this series are from my own collection, books that I've collected with my husband since we were at art school about 20 years ago. We have quite a lot of them. This month I'm going to show you a brand new book that I devoured in a few sittings. Um, a book that I've had since I was a teenager and a graphic novel that I absolutely love. I hope you enjoy looking at these three books for this month. So let's start with some art. This is the book that I've had since I was a teenager. My parents took me to on a trip to London when I was about 17 and we went to the Serpentine Gallery to see an exhibition, which I can't remember what it was now. I remember it was a Japanese artist, but I can't remember her name, sadly. Anyway, we were in the gallery shop afterwards and my dad saw me browsing this book and asked me if I'd like to have it. Um, and it's been a treasured possession of mine ever since and travelled with, with me wherever I've lived. Um, yeah, and I've just always come back to it for inspiration if I'm feeling a bit stuck. Um, and it's a retrospective book um, of the work of Jean-Michel Basquiat. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. I've heard it pronounced so many different ways uh, over the years, but I think that one feels like the most natural to me. Um, anyway, I hope I'm saying it okay. But it's a retrospective of his work from the Whitney Museum um, from the 1990s. Um, yeah, and it's just a beautiful, huge collection of all of his work. If you aren't familiar with Basquiat's work, he was an artist who worked mainly in the 1980s um, and he tragically died in 1988 at just 27. Um, I think he had a, a drugs overdose which is very tragic. Um, but he was a huge part of the New York art scene at the time. He was friends with Andy Warhol and he exhibited widely um, and he just has this enduring legacy uh, that just goes on and on from what was a relatively short career, really. I just feel like his work is so different to anything else that came before it. Um, and there's probably been many imitators since. But in it, he used symbols and text to explore his interests in jazz music, sport and underground street life and all the cultural questions of race, society and inequality that arose around those interests as well. I think I was initially drawn to his work because I hadn't seen anything like it at the time and I was a fan of Cy Twombly already and I know that Cy Twombly is an influence of Basquiat's. Um, I just really like this kind of scratchy aesthetic that he has in his work and lots of the little details in it really appealed to me as well. I made quite a lot of my student work on unprimed canvas, which he does as well. And he's just drawings as well, um, which I know I was influenced by from Basquiat's work and also Hockney as well. He did some of his early work was on unprimed canvas. Um, but he also painted on random panels. Let me find some for you, like this. And I actually made a piece that had strips of wood put together like this. I think I covered mine in resin and stuck Haribo sweets all over it, you know, as you do when you're 17, 18. But it was definitely this kind of aesthetic that really influenced that kind of work. I love all these details. And the repetition in his work as well. He repeats things quite a lot in his work kind of almost like he's kind of trying to figure out his way through it, through the ideas that he was having at the time. But of course, coming from the white country bumpkin background that I do is like a massive world away from his black American 1980s New York life. But that's kind of the magic of art, isn't it? It can teach you so much about other cultures and ways of being and seeing. 
and it can transport you to other worlds and teach you about the difficulties and the joys faced there. And I was fascinated by that New York art and gallery life. It looks just so gritty and flamboyantly creative compared to my own background. There's a picture of him in here somewhere. Let me see. Let's find it. That's one of his shows. There's just lots of black and white pictures of his studio and his life. It's a big one. Where is it? There it is. There he is in his studio, 1985. But yeah, I just really like how he used words in his work so much as well. <laughs> I wonder what that's coming on. Look, there's a joker. But yeah, I like how he used these words, like lists of seemingly innocuous things to weird phrases and dates. You can kind of feel like the jazz influence in what appears to be his freeform use of text. And that also inspired me. I've always gone through phases of using my own words in my own art. And I think seeing this work really on, early on kind of influenced that part of my style. And I've seen odd paintings of his throughout my various travels to the USA and Europe, but I didn't actually get to see a whole Basquiat exhibition until there was a big retrospective, retrospective, I can't say it, retrospective at the Barbican in 2018. It was a great show and I really enjoyed it. So yeah, I think this book is out of print now, but there are a few copies of it available on eBay for wildly varying prices. Sadly, I think um, mine is one of the later prints of it, the eighth edition from 1998, so I don't think it's worth that much. But even if it was a first edition and worth thousands, I still don't think I'd sell it. It's such a valuable book to me, not only um, for the content, but also how I acquired it. It reminds me of that, that trip to London with my parents. Good times. So anyway, that's that one, Jean-Michel Basquiat. So on to the next book. We've gone from a 25-year-old book to a brand new book, which I bought last month, and it is a creative, sorry, The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. And what a gem this book is. There's not so much to look at as it's all text. So as with Braiding Sweetgrass from my other book video last month, I will try and keep this as short as possible. But I sat and read this book every evening until I was through with it, which was like a matter of days. Rick Rubin is a music producer who's worked with bands of different genres throughout his career. And he's packed into this book a wonderful selection of creative things he's learned over the course of his life and it's basically a manual on how to live a creative life like how to be open to the world and then channel that into your artistic work and he talks about ways to overcome potential blocks and self-doubt and how to make art in whatever discipline you happen to work in that's authentic and true to your beliefs as an artist We've got a visitor. He always knows when I'm recording. Naughty cat, go away. I love you. So where was I? Where was I? So honestly, I could not have read this book at a better time as I was embarking on making that large painting I showed you right at the beginning last month. Um, and so much of what he said has been percolating in my mind from other things I'd read or listened to recently. And it basically crystallised a lot of what I had been thinking about. Um, yeah, there was just a whole lot of synchronicity happening when I read this. Put it that way. <laughs> There's just lots of gems inside it. The titles of the chapters, Nature as Teacher. I folded this one over because it's one I want to keep coming back to. Self-doubt goes through all sorts make it up and at the end of a lot of chapters are just little little bits that will connect you to the what he's read kind of a, a little summary art creates a profound connection between the artist and the audience through that connection both can heal find another one 
Beware of the assumption that the way you work is the best way simply because it's the way you've done it before. Talent is the ability to let ideas manifest themselves through you. I really like that one. And it's just, it's written in quite short snippets. No chapters are very long and they're quite little chunks. The work reveals itself as you go. I did read one review of it that kind of described it as has, having your stone mate round, waxing lyrical late into the evening. And I am paraphrasing here, I can't remember it exactly. It was when I was buying it, I just had a flick through some reviews and this didn't put me off at all. Um, but yeah, like having somebody there just going on and on about this mystical stuff they're into, yeah. And it kind of does have undertones of that, but the creative act and living a creative life is a magical thing to be able to do, I think. So yeah, to be able to tune into that alchemy needed to make something powerful you have to think deeply about the world and this book is a great read for anyone wanting to empower that connection within themselves or deepen their understanding of what it is to be a creative and and at times it does lean more towards the creation of music I mean he is a music producer after all um, but I absolutely loved it I love to learn from other disciplines anyway and I'll be dipping back into it whenever I need to spur on that creative impulse um, yeah if you want to live a creative life I urge you to go and get this and read it you won't regret it one bit and lastly we change tack again with Isabel Greenberg's Glass Town which is a fictionalized novel of the young Bronte sisters and their brother Branwell now I know it makes me sound like a bit of a heathen but I don't know much at all about the Brontes oh hello back again come on off you go this is why my desk is covered in cat hairs he just he just comes along has a little stroll about, drinks some paint water and off he goes again. So yeah, I don't really know much about the Brontes, but I do know that they wrote the classics like Jane Eyre and Wuthering Heights between them. But aside from that, before I read this and then looked them up further, I knew very little about them and their lives. So I went into this reading it kind of cold and I really liked it. So the story follows the young Brontes and their imaginations writing stories about a place called Glastown, which they did write about in real life. And it's kind of how they follow their own passions within the Glastown universe and how their real lives get intertwined with the imaginary. Um, I won't give away any more, just in case you do want to give it a try. Um, so I'll come at this from a stylistic point of view rather than a literary one. Although I will say that I really like the kind of more modern turns of phrase occasionally used by the characters. There's something quite Wes Anderson about it and it's really entertaining. So I was drawn to it after seeing someone post about it on Instagram and it was Isabel Greenberg's drawing style that really hooked me in. I hadn't heard of her before I saw this post. Um, and at the time I was really obsessed with the idea of making a graphic novel. Um, I do like to write sometimes too. Um, and I've worked on a couple of passion projects in that vein and seeing her really easy looking kind of scribbly style where the characters don't look exactly the same in each panel was so refreshing. I love all the tiny hands and feet too. Little tiny foot. <laughs> just funny drawings, they're brilliant. And I just really also like the way her own font has been used throughout. It kind of really works so well with the style of the drawing. And I particularly like the imaginative imagery and this scene of the siblings getting ideas from other books and the little characters coming out of those books. Look at that. And into their world. And then over the page, them looking at the new town they built. Oh, what a marvellous thing we built. What should we call it, Tally? Glass Town. And then over the page again, this scene of them excitedly writing more characters and plots. And then there are so many little bits which I also love. I did put up one of them here. If I don't marry him, I will literally die. Flump! She just falls to the ground at her father's feet. It's just brilliant. I really like that. So yeah, it's a really gorgeous graphic novel. So much imagination and world building has gone into it. Um, plus, reading a graphic novel is a great and different experience to reading a straight up fiction novel. And I just think this one's a great way to kind of ease yourself into that kind of reading. Look at these. I just love the composition of them really lovely 
So that's it for this month. I hope you enjoyed hearing about this selection of books. I will write their names all in the notes underneath this recording as well. And if you have any suggestions on the sort of book you might like to hear about, please do leave me a comment and I will see what I have in my collection that I may be able to talk to you about next time. Don't forget to subscribe and give this video a like if you enjoy it. Thanks for watching.